So here we go. Uh, the last topic. You tired, Willie? You're okay? All right. Look at all these genius. All right. So uh, last topic is on particles. And um, I, this topic can be very complicated if you do this at a higher level, because then it talks about like quarks and neutrinos and uh, other really weird subatomic antimatter particles. We're not going to talk too much about those guys. Uh, neutrinos and antimatter. So yes, we'll talk a little bit about antimatter, but really, really not a lot. It's not the focus of this at all. We're still dealing with um, with a lot of a very concrete physics here. It's called particle physics because we're talking about particles, subatomic particles more specifically. Uh, we'll also do some chemistry today, which is weird because we're in physics class. Physics is chemistry. You guys all understand that, right? And biology is all chemistry. So therefore, biology is physics, and physics is everything. So there you go. Physics is the best. All right. Um, we have to talk a little bit about the atomic model, right? Not so much. Um, we're not so interested about electrons today. We're talking about nuclear chemistry. Uh, that means that we need to understand about the nuclear. So uh, the Romans, way back in the day, they stipulated that atoms are just like these billiard balls. It's like a ball. If you stick them on next to each other and you get a substance. Gold is just a bunch of gold balls next to each other. And that's that's what a gold coin is or whatever. Uh, it wasn't that, obviously, because we came up with a lot better uh, understanding. J.J. Thompson came up with the concept of uh, elect negative, negatively charged uh, particles in the atom, but they still didn't understand that it wasn't a billiard ball. So this is the plum pudding model. Did you guys know that plum pudding is British for? What is the actual North American equivalent of a plum pudding? I bet you won't guess it. It's so weird. It's what? <laughs> it's a blueberry muffin. Yeah. Wrap your hand around that. Uh, but they did invent the English language first, so I guess they're right and we're wrong. Um, so yeah, so they said that there's electrons like slapped on top of these billiard balls. That's also not true because this guy Rutherford, which is the important guy for our topic today, what he did is he took a bunch of alpha particles, and we'll learn about what those are later on. He took a bunch of alpha particles and launched them at atoms. And he saw that most of the time they went right through. Um, so he did this experiment on a gold uh, sheet. Imagine a very thin gold sheet. It's so thin that it's one atom thick. Right, and so he was throwing a bunch of alpha particles at it, and he was noticing that on the screen behind it, it was absorbing a whole bunch of those alpha particles, and it wasn't getting, it wasn't hitting the, uh, it wasn't hitting the gold sheet. And only once every two thousand or so times would it bounce backwards. So what he noticed is that the atom is actually not a billiard ball; it's actually a tiny, tiny, tiny thing, right, with a whole bunch of empty space around it where the electrons are. Right. So he basically discovered this concept of a nucleus being in existence. So something that was the rest of it kind of being empty space. Um, that's really important because that's what we need for today. And of course, Bohr came up on a little bit later and discovered that, um, that there are actual different electronic shells where the electrons can reside. Uh, we're not going to talk so much about that because of the nuclear chemistry and we talk about the nuclear. So, Rutherford, right now, what we care about. Real quick, super simple stuff. Atoms are made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Which of these three particles are in the nucleus? Do you guys remember? Protons, neutrons. All right, so these two are in the nucleus. And for this topic, I'm going to give you guys a new term to learn. 
Uh, when we're talking about any kind of particle that exists in the nucleus, we call that a nucleon, right? So particles in the nucleus is equal to a nucleon, all right? It's a new term, we're gonna use it a lot this time, right? Roughly speaking, what you guys know up until now is that the majority of the mass of an atom comes from the nucleus, right? Because the electrons are relatively small in that. What you guys know is that the proton is roughly the same mass as, an, as a neutron, and that those both of those are way bigger than an electron. Right? We're going to change that a little bit. Here, right? So protons and neutrons are not exactly the same. They're slightly different but very important. That difference is very, very, very important. Some basic notation. This is what's called the isotope notation. All right, so I'm going to refer to it as that. Isotope notation. This is the this big X here. That's the element's identity. So whether we're talking about hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, plutonium, uranium, whatever it is, we write that in big symbols um, where that x is. Z is the atomic number. The atomic number determines what uh, atom we're talking about, right? So if I have an atomic number of two, what atom am I talking about? This one? Helium, exactly. How many protons does helium have? Two. If I'm talking about carbon, what's the atomic number? Which one? Six. Yeah, carbon is six. Uh, how many protons does carbon have? So what's the conclusion between the atomic number and the number of protons? The same, all right? So the number of protons determines the identity, and that's how we classify them in the periodic table. Um, up here is not the number of neutrons. It's not the number of the atomic mass. So the atomic mass, you guys know if you look at your periodic table, it's that number. It's not that either. A is the nucleon, the number of nucleons, all right? So can you determine, if I give you the number of nucleons, can you determine the number of neutrons? Yes or no? Yeah, as long as you have the number of protons. So real quick, let's just do that here. Um, so carbon has an atomic number of six. It's got six protons and six nucleons, right? Uh, sorry, 12 nucleons. So how many, uh, how many neutrons does this have? Six, 12 minus six. And that's your number of neutrons. The reason why that is because your number of protons plus the number of neutrons gives you all of the nucleons, right? Um, you don't need to memorize this. I don't even know what to say. Uh, all right, so. Um, these are just some numbers that you'll be given, of course, uh, but you will need to use them. Are they familiar to you? Yes, they are. I hope they are. Do you notice that protons and neutrons are slightly different than that? Slightly different, right? It's when we're talking about big things, the difference is not important. When you're talking about very small things, that difference is important, all right? So please, for this topic, what I would ask you guys to do is use all the number of significant figures all the time. Everything that we have is a constant. Right, so the mass of a proton is a constant, the mass of an electron, mass of a neutron, all constant. Oh, yes, that's a mistake. The neutron, you mean, right? The neutron, not the proton. All right, so that's a mistake. Um, there is no charge for a neutron. It's neutral, and therefore it's called a neutron. All right. Basic still, before we get into the more complicated stuff. Still not that complicated, but you know, above what you guys are currently used to. So if I had carbon six here, and this is actually it's not carbon six, it's carbon twelve. It's the twelfth isotope of carbon. Um, what happens if you change the number of electrons? What do I get? A different Different charge and, and, and an atom with a different charge is called a ion. Yeah, exactly. So this is ion. Um, you get an ion. If you change the number of electrons, you change the number of ions. 
What happens if you change the number of protons? What do I get? A different element. What happens if you change the number of neutrons? Do what? Yeah, a different isotope. Different isotope. Okay? You need to basically add that in grain in you for two so you can do this part quickly, okay? Hydrogen has two very stable um, isotopes that you use a lot in biology. Um, anyone ever had to do a gastroscopy, I think it is? No. Colonoscopy. No one had to do one of those? No? Can't, to be honest, I can't remember which one, is, which one it is. Is that a gastroscopy or a colonoscopy? One's up here, the other one's not up here. <laughs> The point is that there's one where you have to drink radioactive material, and it's uh, sometimes they give you a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Well, sometimes it's deuterium, sometimes it's chlorine that they give you, but um, it all depends on where in the world you're talking about. But these are the very common isotopes of hydrogen. They're called um, protium, because it's just a proton, deuterium, and tritium. Right? And the only difference between these is that I'm adding a neutron. You can look at it here. All I have is one proton. Then I have one proton and one neutron. Then I have one proton and two neutrons. Always one proton, which means that every single one of these, the identity is which atom? Hydrogen. Always hydrogen, right? So that number that's changing, what's that number that's changing? Yeah, it's the nucleons that are changing, not the number of neutrons. Right, the first one has how many neutrons? How many neutrons are there in, in protium? Zero. Zero, exactly. Even though it's written one up here, it's the number of uh, nucleons. All right, okay, so let's get into the more uh, complicated stuff. Right? Here we have something called a stability graph. Right? And what this is plotting is the likelihood of, um, of a of a certain isotope existing, right? My x-axis, I have the number of protons. Number of protons determines what again? That. The atomic number of the, the element, the element, right? And so, if, as I'm going to the right on my x-axis, I'm changing my element. As I'm going up on my x-axis, I'm changing the number of neutrons. So if, I, if I have uh, zero, or no, not zero, because that doesn't exist, but if I have one proton, on 140 neutrons, what element am I talking about? Yeah, it's hydrogen. Now, what's interesting is that you have to be on this, this blue line, this blue dotted line, in order to be considered stable, okay? So in the case of one proton and 140 neutrons, what's making it unstable? Is it the number of protons or the number of neutrons? Neutrons. Okay, so we're going to need to remember that um, there is a stability number. Now, this red and green line are very interesting. When you're talking about low atomic numbers, all right, so atomic numbers of anything below iron, right, the stability is closer to this red line. And this red line is when the proton neutron ratio is just one. There's the same number of protons as the same number of neutrons, all right? But as you get to a higher atomic numbers, so anything above iron, which is 56, of the atomic so you go to above 56, then it starts to become closer to um, this green line, which is 1.5 neutrons for every one proton. Why do you think that is? Why is it that when you add, when you go up in atomic numbers, you need more neutrons to be stable? You're so close. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot more electrostatic force. Remember the first thing we did in ENM last year was Coulomb's law? Charges repel each other, right? So if you're trying to cram all these protons into this small area, then the repulsive forces are going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. So you're going to need more neutrons in there to stabilize it, all right? Because the, the neutrons will actually space out the positive charges. And then um, and it will be more stable. Everyone's yawning. This guy is sleeping. It's Friday afternoon. Bear with me, guys. Come on. Wake up. Um, 
Do I want to mention that right now? No, I'll mention it a little bit later. Yeah, I'll mention it a little bit later. Now, if I had if I had helium, right? What's the nuclear structure of helium? What's in the nucleus of a helium atom? Got an atomic number of what? Two. So it's got at least two what? It's got two protons. And mostly, what's the atomic mass of uh, of helium? It's what? Four. So approximately how many neutrons? Two neutrons. Right? So I have two protons, two neutrons. It's in that one-to-one -one ratio zone, right? It's stable. It's got two neutrons, two protons. So equal number of protons and neutrons, relatively stable. But why aren't those two protons repelling each other? It's still two protons. Right? So there is this fundamental force of nature called strong forces, right? And they're incredibly strong when you're dealing with very small distance, all right? So if you put two photons really, 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 really close to each other, we're talking about centimeters, centimeters, one times to the minus 15 meters, all right? Uh, if you're talking about centimeters, which is a thousandth of a picometer, which is a thousand of a nanometer, which is a billion of a meter. So you're talking about putting two protons this close to each other, they actually attract each other because there's a strong force pushing them together. All right? There is an electrostatic force that's repelling them, but the strong force is way stronger than that electrostatic force. Okay? So that's why they don't push each other. Now, if you get to a bigger, bigger nucleus, right? That means that, let's say I were to Let's say Robert's a rugby player, and, and who has ever watched a rugby player? Maybe that's a better question. Yeah, the ball lands, and then everyone piles up on top of it, right? So the first person who goes on top of the ball, he's the closest to the ball, right? The last person who jumps on top of the pile, so everyone jumping onto the same pile, the last person is really far from the center, right? So the last person, if you were talking about protons and neutrons, right? The last person who jumps onto the pile, he is feeling more strong forces or less strong forces? Less. So he's got less strong forces to be able to um, to be able to stick to be close to the, the center where the ball is. Right, so he doesn't have as many strong forces, whereas the one who's closest to the center is going to have the stronger force. That's why <clears throat> when you get into the bigger atoms, the strong forces get weaker because the nucleus is bigger. All the particles are further apart from each other, and the electrostatic forces start to win. Right, when the electrostatic forces start to win over your strong forces, then you you deal with instability. Right, and um, when we're talking about atomic bombs. It's Splitting the atom. You guys ever heard that expression? Splitting the atom, right? That's literally breaking apart strong forces, right? And breaking apart strong forces, as we're going to find out today, requires a lot of energy, all right? And this is the whole idea of the atomic bombs and nuclear power plants and everything. Okay. Any questions on this? You guys recognize this equation? It's famous. This is why most people think Einstein won um, the Nobel Prize. It's not true. It's uh, it's his third thing. So we've done all of Einstein's assignments. Isn't that great? You guys are in the C depth and you understand what Einstein did. He did photoelectric effect. He did relativity, and then he did this. Right. And this is one of um, one of the, the three big things that Einstein came up with. So he said, and this is kind of a stretch. Right. So imagine that. Um, this kind of breaks your laws of logic in your mind. In my in this equation here, what is a constant? C is a constant. So essentially, what I'm saying is that energy is proportional to mass. Well, that's it. There is no other variable in this equation other than energy and mass. There is a relationship between energy and mass. And that's crazy if you think about it, because does that mean that energy has a mass? Maybe, right? If I'm talking about a joule, is a joule, can it be represented as a mass? 
It's not really interpreted that way, but the other, if vice versa is a certain amount of mass can be um, can be described as a as a as a unit of energy. So we're going to talk about. So in this equation, uh, we have to learn a few things. First of all, energy is going to be measured in joules, right? C is no longer three times ten to the eight. All right, it's this number here. Remember, I said use all the significant figures as possible. Use all of them, all right? And um, and we're going to talk about these AMU units in a second. Should I talk about that now? No. <coughs> um, you guys have heard of, like, if you look at the periodic table, there's the atomic mass. The atomic mass represents the mass of an, an atom in what unit? In chemistry, what do you use? In what? In chemistry, what do you use? What's the unit? Gram per gram per mole. Grams per mole. Yikes! Yikes! All right. So grams per mole. Um, we don't really. That's not the real definition of what that number is. That is a weighted average of all the isotopes of something, all right? So for example, if you look at carbon, on top of carbon is going to be written 12.01, right? And that doesn't mean that carbon weighs 12 grams per mole, 12.01 grams per mole. It means that if you took all the isotopes of carbon and did an average of it, those weigh 12.01 grams per mole. There are many isotopes of carbon. There's carbon 12, there is carbon 14, there's carbon 16, and so on and so forth. But by and far, the majority of it is carbon 12. Right? And that's why the atomic mass is so close to carbon 12, to 12, because most of it is 12. Now, if I were to take just carbon 12, not the weighted average of all the different isotopes, but the just carbon 12, what would its atomic mass be or its molar mass be? It would be? I hear someone talking. I don't know who it is, and I don't know what they're saying. One twelve? No, it's just twelve. Right? Is that what you said, Andre? Admit to your mistake. No, I actually heard you say one, and everyone around you heard you say it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's. It's 12, all right? So the atomic mass of carbon 12 is exactly 12. And the reason for that is because the atomic mass is defined by carbon, all right? Carbon is like the standard uh, weight for everything. One atomic mass unit is a 12th of a carbon 12 atom, all right? And it's defined by carbon. The reason for that is the most abundant um, atom on the planet, and it's easy to work with because it's relatively large. All right, so that's exactly what this says here. One atomic mass unit is defined as exactly one twelfth of carbon twelve, right? And one AMU is equal to this number exactly. Again, we're using all the number of significant figures possible. Okay. What does this number look like? Where did you almost see this number? A charge? Nope. Mass of a proton? Proton. Yeah. And when we did ENM, we used this a lot, mass of a proton. It wasn't even this number, though. It was close to this number. It was 1.67, not 1.66. This one's not even close to 1.67. So proton is actually more than one. So now let's do some calculations. And let's use that equation. What is the energy associated with one AMU? One AMU is equal to 1.605 and to the minus 20. Let's figure it out using this equation here. Remember to use the speed of light with all of its significant figures. Thank <laughs> you. 
So what did you guys get? Joule, right? All right, so that's a, that's a quite a strange number. Um, but it's essentially, if we, use, if we use Einstein's equation to determine what energy is associated with one atomic mass unit, we get this random number of joules. Um, Hugo, are you confused? Did I get, get, get it wrong? You guys say okay, good. There is a more convenient unit. Remember we talked about electron volts? When we're talking about really, really small energy, let's always convert it to electron volts. And if you remember to do that, you got to divide it by the charge of an electron, which is what? It's approximately this. Give me an answer in electron volts. Because joules are inconvenient. We're trying to get rid of joules. We're trying to go towards electron volts. It'll give us a nicer number. What number did you get? All right, that's not any cleaner, is it? It's just as dirty as a number. So we have to find an even better one. Let's talk about these in multiples of electron volts. So you can have a thousand electron volts, which would be a kilo electron volt. What's a thousand thousand electron volt? Think computers. You have a byte, a kilobytes, and then a what? A megabyte, yeah. So you can convert this into mega electron volt. It's going to be 932.74 mega electron volt. Okay. This number is super important. There's no randomly that I ask you guys to do this because we use a standardized 1 AMU to calculate it. Okay, so we can take atoms that are measured in AMU and convert them to an energy now because we have what an energy is equivalent to one single AMU. This number, remember it. Stop that. Thank you. Any question on how I got to this answer? Capital M is mega. What comes after mega? And after that? What's after that? Yeah, actually, I actually have no idea. I stop at terabytes because that's, I mean, you can get hard drives now that are terabytes. It's, it's pretty common. All right. So the energy associated uh, that we just calculated, we call that the binding energy. There's a, there's a bunch of other terms for it, but we're going to refer to it as the binding energy. And it's important to know that a one proton is exactly this amount of atomic mass unit. All right. One neutron is exactly this, this amount of atomic mass unit. One electron, this much atomic mass. If I had a single helium atom, what would its binding energy be? First of all, what is uh, how many AMUs is in a helium atom? Helium is what? How many protons does it have? How many neutrons does it have? How many electrons does it have? Two. It's a it's an inner Right, so it has to satisfy its, uh, its shell, two for the first shell. Um, perfect. So we can figure out how many AMU there is. So there's two times 1.007835 plus two times 1.008665 plus two times 0.0004858. That would be the atomic mass of helium. Should be close to four, but not exactly four. Uh, 
don't have a number for me. Units? All right. AMU is atomic mass units. We can sometimes abbreviate that as just U, and that's what I'm going to do. All right. Same thing, AMU or U. Lazy way to do it. Who's got a periodic table on them right now? No. Okay, so yeah, so Justin, are you Googling it? Can you look up the atomic mass of uh, helium? Is that close? Pretty close. Is it the same? No. All right. And this is the fundamental problem that we're dealing with right now. All right. So, what we did here it is. I looked it up on Wikipedia. It's 4.002602 units for helium. And we calculated individual ones with a high degree of precision by adding up all its protons, adding up all its neutrons, adding up all its electrons. Individually, those parts actually weigh more than when you put them all together. And that's, that breaks the law of the conservation of mass, right? Remember, up until now, that's the only law that we never broke. And now we're breaking that one too, right? So uh, you take all the different ingredients, put them together, and it's a, it's a different mass when you put them together. And that's crazy. That difference in mass is called mass defect, right? So uh, let's find out what that mass defect is. So we said 4.03, 40771, minus its actual mass. And we get something called the mass defect, which you write down as delta n. So what is that um, that difference? Can someone do a calculation for me? There is a difference of 0 0.03, more than an electron, a lot bigger than an electron amount of mass um, that's kind of missing. That mass is what Einstein calls mass energy, or rest mass energy. Okay? So that's going to be the mass that we're going to use to determine um, how much energy is required to break apart a helium atom into its constitutive parts. Okay? So let's say uh, there is 4.0026 amounts of energy in the atom itself. When you break it apart, you get 4.03 um, AMU's equivalent. So let's figure out what, so this, we're going to call this energy. So I'm going to call this rest mass energy. And keeping that number, we can figure out how much energy it's worth, right? Because we have the, um, we have this value, which is 930, what was it that we said it was? 932.74. Mega electron volts per AMU. So, how many electron mega electron volts are there per one helium atom broken down into its parts minus its actual mass? So, we're going to look at a 0 I should guess something like 27 or something like that. 29? 29 point? That's good, thank you. So 
So now this, what this means is that if I took all the different constituents of the atom and removed this much energy, I would get the actual atom itself. That's for helium alone, all right? And there's a chart that describes this. Um, this chart measures all the, it's called binding energy because it's the amount of energy required to bind the, the particles together to form the atom itself. We call that binding energy. And um, we measure normally binding energy per nucleon. We don't measure just regular binding energy. We do it per nucleon. How many nucleons are there in helium? Four, right? So let's divide this by four. What's my, what's my binding energy for helium per nucleon? Seven point. So this binding energy, let's call it B B actually, just so that we separate this from anything else. This binding energy is for helium is standardized at four point at seven point three three nine three three nine five. This is for which isotope of helium? How many neutrons does it have? How many protons does it have? So it's for helium-4 specifically, all right? It's exactly for that one isotope. So here we have a chart that takes every single atom and every single isotope and plots it with respect to its binding energy. And here, look at that. There is our helium-4 that we just calculated at 7.33, and we calculated to a pretty high level of precision, and we're pretty good. We got it pretty close, right? It's near 7, all right? And so uh, you can you can actually find so here's helium three down here. That's another um, isotope of helium. It'll have a different binding energy. It's way down there. Essentially, in this graph, what you need to know is the higher the binding energy, the more stable it is. Okay. So higher the binding energy, more stable. According to this graph, what is the most stable atom? Looks like what? Iron, looks like iron, yeah. Um, iron is pretty high up there in terms of its stability, and in fact, everything, or almost everything before iron is less stable. So these two guys are going to try to come together to form iron, because they're smaller masses, right? So smaller atoms are gonna to come together to become a bigger atom and become iron. So this is what we call nuclear fusion. And heavier ones that are coming in this direction, right? Are, they're heavier and they're going to want to become iron to become more stable. So the atoms are going to break apart. And the opposite of fusion is fission, exactly. So all those atoms beyond iron are going to do nuclear fission to, to come towards um, come towards iron. Iron is kind of like that, the standard. So here's a statement. I want you guys to try and think about it. The hottest stars in our make iron, but nothing heavier than that. Why? The hottest stars in our universe can make elements up to iron, but not. It's not that they cannot produce hotter elements or heavier elements. It's just that those heavier elements are simply not stable, right? So you can make uranium in a star and decay back down to, to iron, all right? And so you need some incredibly um, non-star scale energy in order to, to contain uranium in a, in, a, in a stable way, in such a way that it doesn't decay. 
you guys know where uranium is made? Or not, maybe not uranium, but maybe the higher elements are made? So something like, um, what's higher than, what's higher than higher and that's pretty stable? I wish I had a periodic table here. Anyways, it, it, let's take any element heavier than iron, right? Anyone know how it's made? Because obviously in our planet, we have all these different elements. So anyone know how it's made? Where it's made? No, they exist in the nature. Nature, I mean, that's, a, that's not totally the wrong word. It's not nature. It's in the cosmos, if you want to call that the nature. And supernova, you guys know what supernova is? When the biggest stars in our universe is, you reach the end of their lifespan, they undergo something called a supernova, and it's sometimes called a hypernova, um, with basically an enormous explosion that lights up the entire sky. Um, that's where those heavier elements are made. Because only in those conditions are those elements more stable. Uh, any questions on this? No? So here's some uh, quick little things that we came up with. The mass constituents of an atom are different than that of a combined mass. Let me ask you a question now. If I took uranium and added up all of its uh, particles, all of its neutrons, protons, and electrons, would it be heavier or less heavy than uranium itself combined? Let's call it, uranium is the atomic number of 92. The 92 protons plus what's that? 238 minus 92. One hundred and forty-six neutrons. Let's say electrons are negligible, right? Compared to the atomic mass of uranium 238. Can someone look up the atomic mass of uranium 238? Yeah. 238 point. If I were to compare these two sides of my inequality, so I'm going to put a question mark there. Which side is heavier? So I'll remind you that in helium, which one is heavier, the individual parts or the whole the whole atom? Which one is heavier in, in helium? Individual parts. What about for uranium now? Which one's heavier? The 238. Does anyone know why? What's the difference in mass going to represent? The energy, exactly. So the difference in mass is the energy. And in this case, the individual parts are more stable than the atom itself. So of course, it's going to be the atom plus the energy is going to be equal to the different parts together. Okay? So it's the opposite of helium. That's the that extra energy. It's going to be the energy that's going to be released when uranium decays. And that's what we use for uh, power plants. We use the decaying energy from uranium, 238, to power our power plants. It's an enormous amount of energy. Just real quick, um, we found out that, um, let's go back here. Here. Uh, this was a here. This was the number of joules per AMU, right? One AMU is one atom. If something has an atomic mass of one AMU, it's got one atom, right? Let's say this thing had a, we had a mole of this atom. What's, some, what's Avogadro's number? 6.00, sorry, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms per mole. This is per atom, right? So how, many, how much joules are there in one mole of a substance? Look it up, calculate it. It's a huge number, something times 10 to the power of 12 joules. That's like kilo, mega, giga, tera, right? Tera joules? And, and what's the what's the order of magnitude? Yeah. 
You're on this road, Jesse? Understand to that? Does not make sense. Did you did you use this number here? Pressure's up. Still not. Did you did you remember the minus and the exponent? And you multiplied them, right? Pressure sign. Eight point ninety eight times ten to the thirteen joules. This is for a, a, an atom that has an atomic mass of one. What atom has an atomic mass of one? Approximately. Hydrogen, right? So one mole of hydrogen weighs how much? Approximately. One gram, right? Come on. Work with me here. One mole of hydrogen weighs one gram. If you have hydrogen gas, which is the most common thing, it weighs two grams. One molecule of hydrogen gas weighs two grams, and two grams has something to the power of 13 joules for fusion energy. Ever heard of an H-bond? That's the energy that's coming for an atomic bomb is coming from that. The fusion energy of hydrogen is so great. Now imagine that's just one gram of hydrogen. The sun, our sun, is made up of 70% hydrogen, burning nuclear fusion energy all the freaking time. Imagine the amount of energy that's being emitted by the sun. It's crazy how, how much energy that is, right? And we stupid humans decided to make explosive weapons out of this stuff, right? We, um, we're going to talk about radioactive decay next class, but essentially that, that, that energy that we use to um, to create nuclear power plants has to, I mean, first of all, it's used to steam water, and that water is used as a steam engine inside a reactor. Um, but that leftover product that we have is dangerous for our environment. We're, we'll talk about it next time. But essentially, what I want you guys to understand right now is that this is a humongous, huge amount of energy. All right, huge amount of energy. All right, it's crazy. Nuclear. Did you ever guys hear Trump talking about nuclear energy? He doesn't know anything. Uh, all right. Let's do an example. Uh, work on this. It's exactly what we just did. All right. It's just a different atom. All right. You can you can do this. Yeah.
Give me the answer in joules per mole, right? How about the answer in joules per mole?
I have uh, my, my atom of interest here is carbon-12. It's very important that I said carbon-12 because I know exactly how many neutrons there are. If I just said carbon, that's just the weighted average of all the isotopes. So my, 
My atom might have 12, 13, 14 neutrons. I don't actually know. Right? But what I want is carbon-12 specifically. So if I want carbon-12 specifically, that means I need to um, to, to have the, have a specific number of neutrons, protons, and electrons. So I have six protons plus six neutrons plus six electrons. Can you guys give me what that mass is in AMU? Much? I'll stick with that, AMU. All right. So that's my mass of my atom in AMU. And I can find my mass, um, my mass defect by subtracting the, the this is the all the individual parts. I'm going to subtract the whole atom from it. So it's going to be 12.102 AMU minus 12 AMU, because that's what a carbon 12 weighs. So I'm going to get 0 0.102 AMU. That's my delta M, right? Now I have two options. I can go uh, directly and use E equals MC squared, or I can use the conversion factor that I used before. They're both the same number of calculations. I'll let you decide which one works. I'm going to go the classical way. So I'm going to convert my AMUs into kilograms. So I know that. Um, 0 0.102 AMU multiplied by 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per AMU. My AMUs, they cancel each other out. And so now I can get my mass kilograms. Can someone give me an answer for this? Minus what? Kilogram. All right. Uh, perfect. Now I can use that in E equals MC squared. So E is equal to delta MC squared. Now, Lee, Lee taught it to his class differently, all right? So he wrote, he writes M naught instead of delta M. It's the same thing. The only difference is on the formula sheet, you're going to see M naught C squared. Don't let that kind of look like this. Don't let that confuse you, all right? It's just e equals mc squared. That's it. All right. Please, uh, the, uh, he'll show it to his class differently. I prefer delta m. Um, we're going to do it this way. So delta m is equal to um, 1.6937 times 10 to the 28 kilograms multiplied by 299. I never remember this number off by heart. Where is it? Uh, two nine nine seven nine two four five eight. And then you square that. Can I have the energy of this atom? That's how many joules energy I have. What's the binding energy of this atom? For one atom. Question is asking you for Avogadro's number of atoms for mole. Okay? I have to multiply this by Avogadro's number. I'll take a number from whoever found it, has it. All right. So this is the binding energy of carbon, 12. Um, that's a mole of carbon. It's a lot of carbon atoms. How much is a mole of carbon weight? Approximately? How much? 12. Yeah, I'm not trying to trick you guys. It's 12. Yes, 12. All right. 12 grams is approximately the mass of a mole of carbon. So imagine you have 12 grams of carbon. By the way, you guys, your mass 
It's mostly carbon that I put through. It's a lot of water. But you, you guys are a big chunk of carbon, all right? Um, and just the energy of the carbon atom existing inside you for 12 grams is this much. Cool. All right? Again, that's the binding energy of this. Man. If I were to split the carbon atom, I would get this much energy for more. Okay? So you can imagine how much energy comes out of uh, like a nuclear warhead that might drive on one of these things, right? So they actually, for those nuclear weapons, they actually use more unstable atoms so that the energy is more explosive. And you have to, you can use less of it. Um, I'll let you guys do the math if you want using the isotope. So I want you guys to think about this. Uh, I, we, I asked it to you. Um, why is it that stars only produce atoms up to iron? Okay, so we already talked about this as well. So try to think about this on your own. Right? Ask them if that's what's in your mind. Okay, now we have two options. Here. Option is we start the next topic or we do You guys seem tired. This guy's got his head on the table. I think it's freaking coins. And um, a lot of you are yawning like this. So I don't want to I don't want to go on. It's more of this same kind of you don't have to do it. You have time on Monday to do it if you want. Monday is not the day before the exam. It's two days before the exam. <laughs> so who wants to do it now? Put up your hand. All right. So let's have a good weekend. All right. See you guys.